Friday morning um, House Appropriations Committee meeting. On the top of our agenda is the, um, we are going to start out with the budget of the Department of Vermont Health Access. And we have with us, um, we're doing a joint committee meeting with the House Health Committee. So welcome all of you, it's nice to see you. We have administration here, and we also have Commissioner Gus Gus Fun. I can't say it because I'm on YouTube. I'm sorry, Corey. Um, we have the commissioner here of Diva with his team. And uh, yesterday, um, the other uh, committee of jurisdiction did hear that we are working off. Uh, this is a restated budget working off the 20 uh, uh, 2021 proposal as submitted in January. And we are working to get you the ups and downs from the January proposal and the ups and downs uh, from the uh, restated budget, um, as well as uh, refreshing everyone's minds as we go along of any possible language or changes that we were doing from the governor's recommend. So with that, Corey, uh, we have now from 8.30 um, 8.30 through uh, 9.30, and then we have um, 15 minutes for committee discussion. So I'm hoping we can get through in an hour and welcome. And if you'd like to introduce your team, that would be great. But before we start, Representative Lippert, you're the chair of Health Healthcare. What, do you have um, any opening comments you would like to make? No, nope, just great to be here jointly with you. Let's proceed. Nice to have you. Um, Commissioner, let's. So, yeah, good morning, Corey Gossipson, Department of Vermont Health Access. Commissioner, good morning to both committees. Um, I want to say good to see you. I don't know if you all feel as about how you feel about being back on the screens, but good morning. And uh, I will mention from the department, Lisa Schilling is our financial director. She's on uh, for any sort of technical questions related to. Um, interdepartmental transfers, uh, med groups, anything that, you know, gets detailed enough that it's beyond my scope. And Sarah Clark from the agency is on as well, um, you know, in case you have any bigger picture, um, probably global commitment questions. But um, I think we're, we'll get going. I, before I start, I think I'd like to know how you want to proceed, uh, uh, Madam Chair, that we have... Yeah have narratives and we have um, the ups downs um, that are standard to look at. So it's it's really up to the committee how you would like to walk through this. What we would like you to do is to do your presentation which shows the changes over the proposed um, budget as presented in January. And if you have it prepared, if, if you know of initiatives that were put on the table from January and you're prepared to say, this is still in place, this is still in place, this was an initiative, but we changed it. This one's off the table. As much as you can help us relate back to the January budget would be helpful. Um, if not, you know, we will fill in those gaps uh, yep. and compare the two budgets. And okay. at, stop at natural stopping points at different sections to ask for questions from uh, committee members from either appropriations or um, health care. Sure. So I would like you to lead the discussion so we know uh, the changes and uh, where the 21 budget is going in your department from you. Yep. And the uh, it looks like Teresa has the narrative up and let's let's work off that then. Um, the you know the big picture is um, is you know, of course we always have program and administration on this sheet. Program is the first. Um, is the first segment we're going to talk about um, the you know the overarching um, element that's different. Uh, two there's two things that are different, especially in program for us at Diva um, and at Medicaid is uh, that with the uh, pandemic we essentially stopped doing redeterminations. Um, and we're not removing, there were, there were no people being terminated from Medicaid. There are no people being terminated from Medicaid. That continues today. Um, that means um, along with the economy, let's call it a slowdown, and the, the non-redetermination activity, um, we are picking up in a slowly but surely fashion um, Medicaid uh, members. Population is growing, not at a rate um, that is 
in other states, it's been a, a really large expansion of population. Ours has been just kind of slow and steady. Um, the last number I heard uh, had in my head was is about 8,000. I think it, it since maybe back to February, we're up about 10,000. Um, but uh, that's like the sort of ballpark of uh, slow but steady increase we've had. We haven't had any real, um, you know, in one month time, a large addition of individuals. Um, so that's one piece, more people. Second piece that you will see in the numbers, the second piece is that the 6.2 federal match uh, increase due to CARES Act is really the offset to all of that. So there's more federal dollars offsetting the, um, the program increases. So, um, yeah, Teresa, can I just step in? Changes. Excuse me, I'm sorry, Commissioner. I, there's a lag no when I'm talking and when you hear it. I just wanted to, the, the 6.2 is the FMAP bump. Yes. Okay, I just for, uh, for other legislators, we talk a lot about the additional FMAP bump that has put us um, below, I think we're below 40% now for our match. Uh, which is significant. And this is the, the piece of money that is bringing in the extra $19 million per quarter, um, as long as we're still in a state of emergency as determined on the federal level. And, and this budget is built off an additional 19 million for the second quarter. We're in a state of emergency now, so we got the bump. We got the bump back in the 20 budget, and we got the bump for the first quarter of the 21, and this budget is built on the assumption that we will get that FMAP bump uh, for the second for the second um, quarter of the of 21. Is that correct? Yeah, and I would actually say a little more than a, it's more than an assumption. The uh, current uh, state of emer or public health emergency uh, state of emergency goes until October 23rd, which is into the Excellent. second quarter, um, and the uh, the sort of the CARES Act says uh, the 6.2 will continue to the end of the, the quarter um, that the public health emergency ends in. Presently, it's October 23rd. I did have this conversation a little bit with um, Senate probes, and they were saying, what do you know about what's coming from the federal um, landscape in terms of funding and future opportunities? That's not a question that anyone can probably answer with any sort of certainty, but but um, you know, being asked, I think one of the places we landed in that conversation, so you're up to speed is, um, do we think, I think I'd answer with a question, do we think that the public health emergency in the United States will be under wraps by uh, late October? And probably a lot of people would say no. So there's a potential that if there's another extension that the FMAP increase, that 19 million in federal dollars that you're talking about, um, Madam Chair, would uh, extend into another quarter. And that would, um, you know, obviously uh, intersect with wherever revenues are at that time, general fund, you know, all the other pieces. But um, I wouldn't say that's good news, but that is a piece um, as you budget that um, we, I was asked to sort of look forward um, what could happen, what could change. Um, so the, so to the end, of the, be, the end of the calendar year, Mm -hmm. is, is actually not, it's not an assumption. I think we're, we're pretty good on that. And there's a possibility, a strong possibility we would get it in the third quarter as well, but the budget is not, does not reflect it. So that would be a budget adjustment issue. That's true. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, the, uh, Teresa, if you could just move up a little bit more and we, the, these are the basically the, uh, uh, factors um, that lead to the increase of population and then um, and, and things we've done. So the first piece are related to the CARES Act, those first two bullets, um, extending the coverage periods and then not ending coverage in the emergency unless a customer requests it. That's just something we're actually really seeing right now. Like we, uh, there are people that have other forms of coverage but unless they actually say, I want to end my Medicaid coverage, we are not authorized to do so. Um, we're kind of, that's you know, a little insight to the daily, daily operations. We're, we're trying to navigate that and see how, that, um, how we can um, appropriately um, broach that conversation if necessary. Um, then the, the second part is, is pieces that have been done uh, in the state of Vermont by DIVA, by Medicaid, um, related to these populations that 
they 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 do have a um, an impact on budget, um, but also you know the offset or the the reason we do it is to protect health insurance for Vermonters. So um, I guess let's move on to the next one. These are just a little bit in the in terms of enrollment numbers for background. You will see about a ten thousand overall increase um, from uh, oh it go back. This is yeah, you, you don't get, you're not getting the monthly increases. Sorry, not go back, uh, go down. You can keep going by it. If there's questions on this, I'm, we're happy to talk about them. So next thing is clawback. Um, for the last three, four, I mean, I think I've been in on budget maybe seven or eight times in my time here. Um, I've always come in to tell you that the clawback was an increase in cost. This time it's a decrease, so the 6.2, reduces the clawback impact to our budget by $3 million. And I mean by budget, um, uh, it reduces state uh, contributions by 3 million. So that is an assist to the general fund. All of the, everything FMAP, just again, for context, everything that we get from the federal government is money that doesn't need to come from the general fund and um, either allows us to, to um, as a state to, and, and your committee and, and the legislature, um, to uh, look at those dollars in a different way, possibly, or make up for lost um, or depressed uh, tax revenues or general fund revenues to the state in this. Corey, in this. yes, just for just for clarification, within the nineteen, you know, the nineteen to twenty million of the FMAP bump, does that include this three million dollars of clawback, or is this additional on top of the nineteen? I I, I asked Lisa specifically. My, my I think I believe it's all included. It would be additional. It's not part of the AHS's global commitment. Okay. Thank you. So that's even better news for us. Um, the next is, um, this is a policy conversation we were having during the session. Um, this states um, that we have an up in our budget because of um, delaying the implementation of a um, preferred drug list management of the um, HIV AIDS medications. Um, I, I'm glad that the House Healthcare Committee uh, is on. They were um, you know, very involved in reviewing this with uh, both the department and stakeholders. And um, this is in our, in our budget um, as an increase because the, it was a $1.2 million decrease for a 12 month implementation. So, um, we are projecting in this budget that we would begin um, this change on 1-1 of uh, the next calendar year, so mid-fiscal year, and then that means that the projected savings would be $600,000 less. That's why it's an up and not a down. Um, and again, intersects with what you stated off the top, uh, Madam Chair, is that um, you know, we're, we're not working off last year's budget so that it's a down, it's an up because the up was higher in the previous uh, GovRec. Gov so um, I, I'll, I'll pause. This one is often a, a conversation, not often, but it, it, we have always paused to just see if there are any questions, but um, our, I'll, I'll say it this way, our, there is language that needs to change that we would be, have as a proposal um, and have had as a proposal. And I, I'm, I'm going to say um, with openness to a, a further conversation that I believe this was on a path to being um, okay and approved by, um, okay with the stakeholders and approved by uh, the legislative committees. Um, but, I, but I won't assume that, but it is in our budget. If, it, if we don't uh, move forward with this, um, we would have to find the additional um, dollars. This is a good time to stop for questions, um, <clears throat> especially, you know, why do we have to have this delay? And I will turn it, uh, Representative Lippert has a question, um, and I, I want a refresher of how close we were to accepting this proposal. Uh, Bill? Well, um, my memory is that our committee uh, supports this. Uh, we did, as the commissioner said, we reviewed, we took testimony uh, from stakeholders, and uh, I'm honestly surprised that it wasn't in the Q1 budget. I'm um, yeah, I, the language never. I've been operating it. on the assumption that this had been in place, but apparently not. Well, thank thank you, uh, uh, um, Chair Lippert. I um, 
it we, the language was never finalized for approval, so we did not um, proceed. And that's the explanation. Where's the finalized language needing approval in the appropriations process? Or I, in I'm, be I'm believing now that it has to fall into the to the. But I don't actually. I'm not uh, up on where what is going to be taken up by the legislature. But we would need this language in order to. Um, in the restatement language that was submitted to the legislature by finance and management. Yeah. And we will send out, um, Teresa will send the, um, that full packet of language out. It's color coded and it's really easy to follow. Um, to so just, if I can just be clear that you, you, you need, who needs, who needs something from our committee or do you need anything from our committee at this yes. point? House Appropriations will want it in a very quick informal memo. We, we can do that very quickly. We've, we've taken the testimony, it. we've done the debate, and we're in support of this. Right, but I want you to approve the new language, which you haven't seen. There's some tweaks to the language. So okay. I want to make sure that okay. well, that's, that's, the new language. Thank you. Will be in the budget. Okay. And, and so, Teresa, if you'd send out the language to all the all the House members, that would be really helpful. And um, if anyone wants to listen in at 10 o'clock on Monday, uh, Matt Riven from the administration will be in to walk through all of the language changes with our committee. So if, if anyone wants to jump in or ask Teresa for a link uh, or jump in on YouTube, that would that you may find it helpful. Uh, Thank Commissioner. You. Thank you both. Um, Did you have a follow-up, Bill, or are you? No, no. I we, just... we, and and Chair Lipper, we will offer the follow-up too if you want to have a conversation with us um, about what, what the language looks like. Um, so I would just request that if you, if someone could articulate very clearly what the change in language Absolutely. is, because we yeah. had reviewed the previous language, so that we're not having to sort out what the. We'll uh, do that. If there, if there are changes, what what what's the change other than the time frame? Right. Thank you. Um, okay, and then the next is again uh, addition the FMAP increase hitting our um, dish and chip uh, populations, and this is what that um, what that totals to. It's uh, eight hundred and forty-two thousand dollars of general fund revenue that will not be um, needed. So uh, that's the program side up in people, so up in cost, but with the uh, bump in FMAP. Um, due to the public health emergency and the CARES Act, we um, are uh, using more federal dollars than state dollars um, on, on our entire population. So it more than offsets um, the increase in population and utilization. I don't see any questions on the change in DISH and CHIP. It's just related to the FMAP bump. So yeah, when you see, if you look at the, um, the ups, downs in your sheets, um, on the in the different um, you know fund sources, you know the the um, the global commitment and then you know match non waiver. There are places where these different populations fall, and so um, you know that's just the identification of uh, two of those um, expenditures. Um, okay, so I'm going to move to administration now. Um, the first is is very simple. Um, we have been in the state of a hiring freeze uh, for a while now, and a continuation of those um, freezes uh, produce this uh, in terms of savings um, or non-expenditures. I'm not sure I would necessarily just call them savings, but um, they are um, by not having not hiring into positions, um, we're not spending as much on salary and fringe. Um, you can move up uh, the page, Teresa. Thank you. So contract changes. Um, these are. Yep. Sorry, I was muted, so I couldn't jump in. Um, are you with the hiring freeze? Are you? Are do you have the capabilities of of doing all the work you need to do, or is this putting any strain or stress on the agency to to get work, especially with the Medicaid population increasing? So operationally, um, it's a great question. The operationally, with the um, with not doing redeterminations and not doing a lot, of, basically a lot of the things that we normally do, um, I will say it's 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 okay. Um, if the public health emergency ends, 
and we and we move into open enrollment or uh, sorry, we move into uh, starting restarting redeterminations. Um, the workload would probably be um, greater than uh, what is necessary to manage that, but we would be in a different um, situation at that time. So we'll, I think it's um, not knowing when the public health emergency ends, um, not knowing when redetermination starts. We, you know, trying to predict anything related to that um, is is very difficult. So we have. Um, you know, it's it's a good question because it's the same horizon we're looking at. So, when uh, there's an assumption, I guess that um, we're going to have to cross that bridge when um, the public health emergency ends and we re restart determinations, and that could be a conversation in early 21, or it could be next fiscal year. It's hard to know when that starts, but you're you're really on to what we're looking for uh, forward to operationally when we have to start the work again. The people will be, um, you know, we'll, we'll do what we have to do. I mean, the, the, as the governor has often said, we're going to take what we have in revenues and 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 expend and money to expend and and match that accordingly. And it it may affect how well we're able to execute. Um, but um, you know, we'll we'll have those conversations all along with the with the administration and with the legislature. Thank you, Corey. So if there is pressure, you can address it in budget adjustment or in the 22 budget proposal. Uh, yeah, and forward looking, I mean, it feels like, I mean, this, this, this kind of meeting in August aside, it feels like we are regularly coming to the legislature to talk about what's, what's new and, and that would be something, that would be a change. So yes, you're, those are the next two stopping points in, in our um, budgeting as BAA and, and the next budget cycle, correct. Thank you, Corey. Uh, before we move on to the contract changes, does, do anybody, does anyone have a, a question from either committee? I don't see any, Corey, so let's move on to contract changes. Yep, okay. So the first is an increase to our WEX Health contract. Um, they are the entity, as you I'm sure know, this has been on in and out of our budget for a, a, a while. Um, we are really, really, really close to executing on the transference of the premium processing responsibility to the insurers. Um, as you see in the explanation, the pandemic uh, delayed us, what I would, I would characterize as weeks and just put us up against the open enrollment timeframe where we just couldn't execute. Um, we had um, essentially um, um, people and resource uh, uh, limitations that, uh, that didn't allow us to get the premium collection activity transferred over for 2021. It's a calendar year start um, for this activity. And so, you know, we're projecting for this savings now to be a year later. Um, it's unfortunate, but it, it you know, the, the, the few weeks or, you know, a couple months that we got delayed on this project produces a, a one-year delay, so we have to continue to have it in our our budget. I mean, on the on the I guess if you want to put a silver lining on it, it is a it's it's more methodical, and we have a, a bit of time to make sure we get it right. I, I'm I will say it that way. I'm looking for some positivity to it, but it's it is unfortunate that the um, the pandemic really hit us when it did because we were um, on a path where we were going to achieve. Um, I will say finally, you don't, if you want, you don't have to then. Uh, we, I would say finally moving this piece um, finally off of our, um, our GovRex and our uh, budget adjustments. The next is the Maximus contract increase. This is another one. This is a little bit like the, um, the PDL uh, conversation. We had in our GovRex for FY21, an $817,000 down. Um, we still have a down, but it's not the 817. It's 565,000 less than the 817. Is that did I say that right? I think I did. So we're it's still a down, but it 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 produces an up in this um, because we're working off the gov rec. Um, uh, basically, what happened is the budget was built late in 19 um, while we were uh, I would would not say we were necessarily in the negotiations yet but the the recommendation was based off 
uh, annual, um, we pay by the minute to Maximus and by our annual, annual expenditures over the last few years, this was sort of a, the 817 was a recognition based on our contract, based on uh, what we had actually spent in minutes, we could uh, conceivably reduce our uh, Maximus budget by 817,000. The, the um, <clears throat> excuse me, the total contract is for higher than that. Um, we just didn't use all the, you know, we didn't, we had, we were, um, we were becoming more and more efficient, I would say, with our call center in terms of pro the process improvements. And so what ended up happening was a, a negotiation that, that began really in earnest, probably February of this calendar year. So after the budget was introduced and proposed, um, you know, the uh, long story short, it was going that uh, Maximus had a about a million dollar increase to the to the max of the budget. We uh, had to make some changes, but negotiated uh, pretty um, you know in in good faith both with Maximus and the state, but got that number still below the original contract. So um, this kind of identifies where that contract is at now. It doesn't really have any kind of prediction of what our utilization of minutes will be. Um, what we're, we'll have to see that, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, a budget's a budget and the actuals are the actuals in this conversation because, uh, to the same conversation we had about, um, staffing, if we restart determinations, um, right now, Maximus call, the call center, um, has been very manageable in terms of calls, but if we start doing the redeterminations, we would expect calls to jump back up. So um, again, we can budget off our contract and that's what this does, but really knowing what our utilization over the next nine months is going to be a bit more of a challenge than that. And something that um, a, a little bit like if we start redeterminations before BAA will come in and maybe have a, something to tell you uh, then, or it will be in the 22 budget, how we would, what we would be seeing and would have that conversation that, but um, just a little bit of a foreshadow into an explanation of the how the contract looks like this and, and that it is still a down from uh, FY20 but budget, but it is an, it manifests itself as an up because of it's not a mu as much of a down from the government. So I'll stop. Thank you, Commissioner. We do have one question, uh, Representative Feltis uh, and then Representative Lippert. Please. Marty? Yes. Thank you. I realize you have a contract, and so there's nothing that could be done about that now. And, and this is just an additional observation. We've seen, obviously, you use Maximus, and, and uh, DOL used Maximus, and I think there are other departments that use Maximus for call center usages. Back in the beginning, before you began working with Maximus, did we have some more comprehensive looks at other possible vendors? It just kind of irks me that we're spending all this money to outside vendors when I would hope there would be a local vendor who could help us do this. Can you give me a little background on how that got started? Um, it, it's interesting because the conversation before we began was about how long everybody's been doing this uh, in on the committees. Oh. And uh, I think our relationship with Maximus goes back to the 90s. So I was not definitely not around no. at that conversation time. I think, um, honestly, Rep Feltis, um, we would really uh, be open to a, an examination of what is out there on the mar in the marketplace in terms of call centers. Maximus has, I will say Maximus has been a great partner. The team that is in, uh, there is a team in Burlington. There are people that are um, uh, employed, Vermonters that are employed by Maximus in the Burlington uh, area. Uh, that team has worked really well with us through some pretty, some pretty difficult times. So um, that's just a, a comment to the relationship with that um, entity. First of all, the second thing though mm -hmm. is, in principle, I I, I don't have no uh, disagreement with you. I think we um, we keep running into the theoretical of hey, it would be great to put this out to bid and see what else is out there, um, and then. You know, then there's a pandemic. Then there's a, you know, it's, there's always just something coming along that makes it. Well, let's get through this next time period, and then we will get to, um, you know, that, uh, you know, examination of the of the marketplace, 
in a year, in two years. I, I'll, I'll just say that as sort of the, the, the issue with how I agree, but it, it, mm -hmm. operationally it becomes a little difficult. Okay, I understand. I, it's just an issue that has been raised to me on two or three a, occasions. Thanks. Very, very reasonable and something that is is actually, I mean, on the it's on the whiteboard examining it. And we have a hundred and uh, eight or nine agreements at DIVA um, that we uh, are uh, constantly monitoring and um, you know re-upping. So uh, it's a, it isn't just a Maximus conversation. It's one of these conversations that we have uh, on a regular basis with all of our um, vendors. And then sometimes we'll put something out to bid and only the one vendor will, will uh, put a bid in. So, um, you know, it's, right. it's, I, I appreciate the comment and, and, and uh, really want you to hear that we are um, very interested in, in that sort of activity at Diva. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, uh, Representative Lippert. Oh, for, first, just a, a, a quick note of jargon. I, it took me a few minutes. I think I understand what GovRec is, and I think it's the governor's recommended budget. The governor's yes. recommend, is that what? Yeah, thank you. But it's thank a little you. bit of uh, appropriations and diva Absolutely. jargon that I think maybe should be translated for others who are participating or, li or li listening in. Um, and in terms of Maximus, uh, I'll just I'll just second uh, Representative Feltus's comment that some of us are, that while it appears from what you said that there's a good relationship with Maximus, I think uh, many many legislators uh, do not feel similarly about the relationship with the Department of Labor and the uh, ex enormous amount of money that's being paid to Maximus uh, and compared to the uh, results that Vermonters received as a result. So one of, one of my questions is, because it didn't occur to me till just today, because in, in, in the Joint Fiscal Committee, we also, uh, there was approval to use CRF dollars, I think, to uh, contract with Maximus for the uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development as well. Is there, is there a single contract with Maximus, or does each Department of State Government sep uh, contract and negotiate separately? Um, we have our we have our own contract with Maximus. There was actually a question early on in the in the pandemic and the emergency, could uh, other departments sort of tag on to our um, uh, contract? And the examinations, you know, basically kind of turned back no. I mean, part of uh, the Maximus, the, I would say, complicating factor is. Um, as you know, in, in Medicaid, a dollar it includes the state and the federal dollar. So um, unwinding that for a, a state agency that's paying in with non-matched rate dollars, uh, it got a little complicated. So uh, the simple answer to your question, each has its own relationship. I mean, it's different people too, um, of course. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Commissioner, could you tell me how long a contract that you sign a contract for? How many years? Uh, I, I believe this one is five years. Lisa, does that sound like the the the, okay. the latest update is five years? There are we Correct. have um, some some you know opportunities for um, discontinuing relationships in any contract, but um, yeah, there it says it, it it says a five year amendment with Maximus, so uh, it, yeah. it's. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. But my question is, is there any requirement to put these contracts out to bid? It, it, it's, you know, like with other pieces in state government, depending on what the threshold is, um, you know, with studies and so forth, we, we put them out to bid. Yep. Is yeah, that- a uh, We, uh, there yes. is, there are. And um, in situations, uh, especially this one, um, you know, we asked for a, uh, a waiver of that requirement, basically because of the risk that it would, you know, we were, we were in a position to be negotiating this um, very, fairly closely to the time when uh, we were, uh, the contract was up. And uh, the risk of a changeover, which is regardless of when we were negotiating, the risk of a changeover is always something that's on our minds too. Um, and 
And so, yes, there is a requirement. Uh, Representative Lippert. What is this? Is this is the increase? Uh, what what is uh, maybe Lisa or, or Commissioner can tell us what is the total contractual amount? Um, just over seven million dollars. Thank you. Annually. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, probably this is a conversation to continue when we when the twenty two budget is brought before the legislature uh, to look at contract negotiations and perhaps starting them earlier? Is there, I mean, can you? Uh, to yeah, totally. Um, in, honestly, a little bit of a, uh, you know, I, this gets right back to the conversation about uh, there's in theory and then there's what happens. Um, and if you're looking for a two line explanation, um, changes in leadership um, on the team. And, you know, in, in, in just not ready to, uh, it's a big deal to put out an RFP and to, and to, um, to be able to um, really know what you're looking for, know what, you know, know what the difference between one contract to another looks like. And in, the, in mid last year, we had some pretty significant uh, leadership changes um, in, the, in that unit, in the team that manages that contract. And it felt like more risk to engage in something that, um, as I said to Rep Feltis, as um, Chair Lippert has discussed, and, and your point is good, uh, uh, Chair Toll, that um, it felt like more risk to the, um, to the operation than um, we could really stomach at the time, given the new, newness of the, of the leadership team that was um, uh, really uh, taking over at, um, at the Hayu. I can appreciate that, um, but as as the team is seasoned, th these are something that we we hope that will be seriously looked at. Yeah, we just uh, we just hired a new director um, who came to us. Um, I think she's in her second week now, so um, I agree completely. Let's move on to the next contract, please. Okay, archetype contract increase is. Um, Boy, this one can get pretty wonky pretty quick, but essentially um, we have a lot of reports that Archetype produces for us. Uh, in the neighborhood, I'll, I'll say 700 about that, that have been produced by Archetype over the, over the years. About 130 of those are for CMS reporting that we need. Uh, the other, well, it says, sorry, it says right here. So the others um, are, uh, for us to actually um, run our business. Um, so they're process reporting that are used for us to do the work that we need to do related to um, uh, enrollment and eligibility. And um, essentially what happened was Oracle was um, um, updating their system. So all of our, our work would not be able, would not all of our reporting wouldn't work anymore. So that so this is goes back this conversation goes back um, I want to say almost two years uh, and ADS had um, proposed that they would take over the um, the project uh, of reporting and sort of reconstruct all of these reports by essentially I'll call it reverse engineering um, over time the complicated nature of that effort this demonstrated itself to be too great. And so in February of this calendar year, we implemented a contingency to get Archetype to um, uh, update their business intelligence and the reporting to, to function with the Oracle platform and uh, to get really, to, to Chair Lippert's point, to use acronyms, just so in case you've heard this word, this is the OBIE OFI cutover um, for any of you that have heard those terms before, for those of you that don't, it's, I've just explained it. It's an update and we're moving from one system to another. Um, and uh, it's basically us relying, continuing to rely on archetype for these reports uh, that, are, that are necessary for, to do our work and to report to CMS. And um, it's going to cost us, um, you know, more as it's shown here in the, in the itemization but the, um, there's an offset to, um, as we continue in this, in our 
proposed we had in the proposal that we would reduce archetype there was a proposal that we would increase um uh youth payments to ads so um you know that there's a little bit of a it isn't just a pure increase to archetype it's just we were trying to bring something in house um to the state and it didn't it didn't uh work the way that it was i would say proposed by um in by ads and by um uh you know, it was hoped for. How was that? So ADS is a partner with ADS in this change. I, I, any of these technology projects with with is a partnership with ADS, um, and that goes across state government. But we um, we work closely with their you know technical resources, and they are um, you know uh, they come up with ideas of how they can. I'm sure you've heard this before. Um, reuse uh, platforms and, and efforts across the different departments and produce um, a little bit like Chair Leppert was referring to, does everybody have a different contract with Maximus? The goal is to be a little bit more, um, uh, there's a word I can't, I can't think of right now, but uh, to, use, um, to use elements of our business uh, in other parts of state government, in our in 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 our business as well. So I think that this was a little bit of that, trying to bring it in house and save some money, and it and it just didn't pan out because it was too complicated. Thank you, Corey. Uh, we have we do have a question from Representative uh, Christensen. Yes, and my memory may be hazy on all this, but I remember I think it was last year or the year before where you mentioned a lot of these contracts were going to go were recommended, these companies were recommended by the federal government and that we really, I don't remember them as being free, but the federal government was picking up the bulk of yeah, all right. the You're, Is this yeah. the one? I no, it, it isn't Rep Christensen, but uh, you're in the right ball, you're in the right ballpark. The, the um, there was a move um, again, you're, you're, you are going back a couple of years where um, uh, a, a different form of procur procurement was on the table um, and uh, the federal government was recommending that we engage with a couple of different uh, firms to really uh, uh, push that along. Um, and so those are different contracts. Um, okay, thank you. It is related to integrated eligibility. It was related to integrated eligibility, but that was, yeah, that's a couple of years ago. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see other questions, so let's move on to the Burns and Associates. Yep. Uh, that's an increase in our Burns and Associates uh, are our um, payment um, consultants, really, really top-notch experts in the field of uh, healthcare reimbursement. We are... Um, engaged in payment reform activities across the agency. And the more uh, these payment reform efforts uh, take root in certain areas, the more other parts, other departments within our agency are saying, hey, you know, we might have a good opportunity here to pay for healthcare differently or pay for services differently. Can your team engage um, with, with our team, our, you know, our, uh, our program teams, and this is, you know, uh, DMH. This is Dale, um, even DCF and and VDH. We're really looking at efforts all across, and and as these come forward, um, it does in get involve uh, cons consultation with Burns and Associates at a higher level. So their budget or their, uh, yeah, their our our projection for their budget is an increase in 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 the next in the next year for those reasons. Thank you. Um, I don't see <clears throat> questions there. Um, the, the next is uh, a one-time reduction to the DXC contract. DXC is our uh, uh, our MMIS system. Um, that is the system that pays claims, enrolls providers. Um, really, is the is the sort of uh, system um, backbone to Medicaid. Um, it, is a, it is a fairly substantial contract, um, and when we knew we were in a, a resource downturn, uh, a state revenue downturn, general fund sort of pressures, 
we turned to um, a lot of our um, vendors that had fairly large contracts and essentially asked them, um, you know, what can you do um, to contribute to um, a reduction in our contract and DXC stepped up. So um, a great appreciation to them uh, for this. Um, and it essentially is, is the, it's, there isn't necessarily anything particular um, there's a little bit of we have some money in our contract for change, um, change orders. I think there's a little bit of thought that that that's a little bit of a place where we will um, save. But um, more than anything, it's just them being good partners is how I would characterize that. Commissioner, was the department uh, given a three percent target um, for savings? Uh, we were. Um, I'm not actually sure what our, what our, the reduction in our, I mean, there's our, there's our overall and then there's the GF, right? That's the, the funkiness of our contract always. Um, but, uh, we were, what I will say though, is that, um, the, the 6.2, um, has created, um, you know, I'm not actually sure what the, what the percentage savings in GF that come from the increase in 6.2 um, maybe that's something we can get to you, but we were given the target. What I end up, what I think ended up happening was, um, you know, an appreciation from the agency that in this time, making sure that um, providers were not affected by the change um, in any way, shape, or form, um, as we are in the midst of a health pandemic. Um, so not no change to provider. The, the other part is we don't really have flexibility in terms of changing services or population, those are the other two places that you might make a change in a Medicaid program. With the 6.2 bump, we can't change that as part of the, um, the agreement. So um, I, I appreciate that. I was wondering if you were if you had a 3% target, even beyond the 6.2, the savings you're able to realize because of that. And I was wondering if this DXC contract if, if that's if you were going out to these contracts to try to uh, make the changes to reach that target. Was that in? Was that an independent? Uh, we were making the changes because we didn't know. We were making these requests before we had a finalization of um, the the con. You know, the conversation always goes the department, the agency, the administration, and before we even knew what we did know, we we were working off what we did know, and what we did know was uh, there were the general fund projections were for less money, um, knowing that our um, expenditures come from begin with the general fund and, and receive a federal match that um, we, you know, we, we didn't want um, to not leave stones unturned, I guess is how I would say. It. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before we move to the changes in operations, are there any final questions on the contracts from any members? I'm not seeing any. So uh, we'll go down to your final uh, changes. Okay, so these are, um, uh, yeah, internal service fund obligations, reductions, 122,000. I, I don't have a ton to say about them. Um, if there are questions, I'm, I'm happy to either get the answer or, or have Lisa speak to them, but I'll, I'm going to move on. But we're we're clear, clear in all the budgets with the, um, with the 5% reductions in ADS. Yeah. Um, and then I've already kind of explained this one was anticipation of ADS um, uh, taking over and, and billing us for um, budget, uh, excuse me, business intelligence activities. That's the reporting that Archetype does. Um, and so that this is the, uh, the, the, there's also some dollars in here. You, you'll, you'll note that it's not a one for one um, in terms of the total spend, but um, we also had some spending authority uh, that had been in our budget that we weren't spending on an annual basis that is essentially going away um, from the federal government. So that's that, that sort of finds itself into our budget here um, as an additional, uh, I, you can call it savings, but it was really just authority that lived in our budget in case we had the match rate, the fed, the state match to to and and the and the projects to um, to. That, that are appropriate to, to spend on. Thank you. Uh, a question from Representative Hooper. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I, thanks for your presentation, Commissioner. I, I, 
I am wondering what you are concerned about looking forward. It, it strikes me that your budget is one of those places where as the deep distress to the economy plays out that you're going to see the repercussions of it and the federal emergency will go away and so we won't have the FMAP bump, but you're going to have additional pressures and not have the adjustments from the feds. Can you help us think about how to, and that's a big question and we'll deal with it in the future, but how are you positioning yourself to address that? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't say it a lot better than what you just did. I mean, that's, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's the agency of human services. That's the, um, you know, the conflict or the dichotomy, whatever you want to say, the opposing nature of when the economy um, falls, general fund revenues fall for the state, that's really, you know, to the state. But when the economy uh, softens uh, or depresses, uh, human service, uh, it, you know, is and the, and, the, and the programs and services we provide um, are in greater need usually, right? So um, you basically characterize that in your question. That is the, you know, the concern across, um, I think, the administration, Agency of Human Services for sure, the other departments. But um, it's, ex I, I, the, the simple answer is, you know, we have a, we have a, uh, we, we're not like the federal government. We don't print money. So um, as the revenues and expenditures uh, continue to diverge or, or as we move forward, we will continue in, as uh, Chair Toll mentioned earlier, we'll continue to adapt to here's what we have in terms of funding and here's what we have in terms of the expenditures and make proposals um, that can, you know, end with a zero at least in projection, right? There's always how things actually um, go in between the times when we are discussing our budgeting. But um, I don't have a, I don't have a silver um, bullet for you that says, well, we've got it under control. I, I, I would just say that, um, you know, we've managed both ups and downs in the state over the last um, little greater than a decade. And um, we would continue to do that. I think Vermont's shown itself to be very aware of the um, the needs of the population in in a downturn of the economy. Um, I would also say um, it does appear, and this is now we're into a little bit. Yeah, I mean, we are in this sort of look forward, and and nothing is is for sure. Um, the conversation going on at the federal level are are definitely something that we're interested in, of course, right? We what we do know about the six point two, what we know about the um, the uh, the public health emergency and the, and the state of emergency as, as currently declared, um, those are things we can talk about, but there's also this conversation going on about what's the next round from the federal government of support for local uh, and state entities. Um, I think we've all heard those stories, uh, impossible to predict where those go, but um, that's another part of the, of the, of the process and being aware as we move forward. Are there things, can you take advantage of CRF money that will position you to, um, will put you in a better position to address the inevitable uh, revenue decline? So are, can you, for building out better systems, IT, that sort of thing, are there things you can be doing now with CRF that will so, position us? Yeah, so CRF, um, increasingly, not surprisingly, probably to you all, um, CRF gets increasingly uh, prescriptive as, as how we can use it. And I, I would say that just as a, as a, a proper anticipation by um, the state, let's call it, um, uh, the administration has brought on a consultant to advise um, you know, the federal government is great about handing over money and then coming back and saying, how did you spend it? Um, and so we're doing everything we can to not be in a position in the future to have to give those dollars back. Um, as you mentioned, IT, uh, it does make me think 
about all the projects that have been underway for a long time. So uh, anything that we would want to do quickly uh, seems like a tough one, but it, you know, it, we're not, we're not again, again, just like I said about the contracts with our vendors, um, I won't say there's any stone that we don't want to um, look under and say, is there opportunity um, or just, you know, out of hand dismiss something. So um, we're always open to that, but we do have a, um, a finite amount of resources as it pertains to IT with our ADS partners, with our own team of, of program uh, uh, managers. Uh, and so we're, we have finite resources that uh, if we, you know, it would have to be the juice on those kinds of activities would really have to be there for us and not just be, um, we really think something might be good if we do this. Um, that's just, that would be another sort of generalized consideration I would throw in. Um, I, I will say that in CRF, um, you know, the obviously um, maybe for, this is for those that haven't, you know, seen it, but I'm sure you have. Um, provider stabilization efforts, the hazard pay efforts, those are all to, to try our, our, our best to make sure that in, during a healthcare pandemic, um, that our healthcare providers um, are not being um, exposed to extraordinary pressure. Um, this is of course, as utilization goes, changes. I mean, um, in, in, in some areas, I think that utilization is really back to to normal, whatever you want to call that. Um, but I think that the amount of money that was set aside by the legislature um, is one example of um, where those CFR doll CRF dollars are um, assisting um, really what we need as, an, as a Medicaid program or as a as DIVA, which is um, access to healthcare when needed. Thank you. Uh, Mary, did you have a follow-up or? No. Thank you. Uh, Representative Iacoboni. I think we're just about out of time unless I'm, but uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, what, what is your primary method for controlling per member per month expenditures? We have a fair number of, uh, efforts underway, right? With all of our different payment models, trying to produce better outcomes for um, and, and purchase differently. Um, we have um, engaged with the, the biggest, of course, being our relationship with the accountable care organization as part of the all payer model agreement. Um, and, you know, looking to push delivery system reform so that um, there is greater alignment in the healthcare system and and less um, and better incentives for providers to produce and to uh, act on um, uh, in those, um, you know, prospective payments that we are making. Um, and we've seen uh, you know, on the prospective payment side, we've seen good results in terms of um, shadow, like sort of shadow claims showing uh, in when we pay a prospective payment, uh, utilization is, is down. Um, I think that is speaking to what our big sort of overarching goal is, is to purchase healthcare differently. Um, we do still have some prior authorization um, and in, in place. Um, we're, we've been uh, exploring reduction of that because of the incentive changes. Um, but you know, prior authorization is also aimed towards uh, patient safety. So we don't want to completely uh, give that up either. Um, but I, I think that's the short answer, Rep Yakovon, to your question, which is um, purchasing healthcare different, differently is really, and not having that incentive of fee for service as the primary incentive, because um, we've seen it time and time again. If you pay on a on a per click basis, you're going to get clicks, um, and you don't necessarily. And and again, that, that that might seem theoretical in this conversation, but as you said. Um, we really are focused on purchasing value, value not um, volume. I guess, and thank you, uh, not for today's uh, uh, agenda, but in terms of budgets and driving costs, uh, we'll talk more in the future about the ACO and the uh, relationship to uh, helping with outcomes. That's, that seems to be uh, 
significant investment we're making and I want to make sure it's working. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a great comment. I appreciate it. It's, um, you know, we've always said that this is, um, we, there's a theory behind the case. I think that um, if you go at the beginning, you say, should we leave the healthcare system alone or should we try to, um, to change it? it and, uh, and we've tried a few different ways. We've, we've looked at different modeling and, and we've had things like the blueprint for a long time, but there's a lot more healthcare system out there than the, just the primary care um, you know, piece of the puzzle. And uh, this is our, our current best effort to get um, you know, all of the different kinds of payers in a very diverse system of healthcare into a more aligned methodology, both for the payers and both for, and, the, and all the different providers we have in our system. So um, the examination of its effectiveness is, is something we're very interested in, in as well. It, it, we've always said this is a this is definitely a um, a test of a of what would seem to most people. I think a lot of people I've talked to a, a sound theory. The incentives of fee for service. Um, this is a, a national sort of perspective that the incentives of fee for service don't necessarily produce the best outcomes. So um, you know our our efforts around um, an all payer system. Um, and an accountable set of providers in a network is is something that we think is worth testing. So I appreciate your your vision towards um, evaluation because that's that's on the list as well. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Dave. Did you have a follow-up or? Thank you, Dave. I no, have... thank you. Thank you very much. We have two final questions, and then when you finish with those questions, Corey, we're going over a bit on time, so I want to be respectful of your time. Um, not to discuss because we've discussed them in January and February, but if there are, are highlighted uh, initiatives that are still um, in play that were uh, have not been changed since the 2000 uh, since the January proposal, if you could just give us those topics, and if you can't, Dave and I will be uh, working on uh, finding those. But we have a quick uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Representative uh, Page and then uh, Derpy. Yes, uh, this might be a little bit of out of our scope, but it does go along with what uh, Representative Iacoboni said. Um, your response, your agency is responsible for, I guess, uh, putting together plans for essential health benefits um, regarding various MVP and Blue Cross and Blue Shields, but yet we see some of those costs going up. Um, how do you maintain keep those costs down um, and yet provide the essential services that we need for Vermonters? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think this is a long uh, kind of conversation. If I wanted to answer it in short form, I mean, really the costs, you, you're now in, um, you're now in the world of uh, commercial insurance, um, qualified health plans are, um, you know, we do have uh, an intersection with those. They are the um, commercial insurers uh, paying for health care um, on behalf of a population. How we keep those costs down, I mean, it, that's the intersection with the all-payer model in, in, in one aspect, um, wanting to get some greater alignment um, in terms of um, over, overall healthcare um, and how it is executed on the delivery side by adjusting payment. Um, you know, maybe a little bit of an editorial about it is the cost of those plans um, are the reflection of uh, the, in a simple format, a reflection of the cost of healthcare in, in the state of Vermont. Um, those increases reflect increases. Um, that's why we, I, I will say this, oh, that those increases and their necessity are up for debate, right, in front of the Green Mountain Care Board. That's what the Green Mountain Care Board's job is, to evaluate um, both the uh, necessity of increases, the cost of increases in healthcare through the hospital budget process and the insurance rate review. And um, of course, um, there's another intersection where DFR is responsible for um, you know, certifying that the solvency of those insurers 
um, is um, is adequate is would be uh, protected by the rates that the Green Mountain Care Board um, approves. So, if we Diva does have an intersection on the certification of the plans. Um, we have not certified plans before. Last year, I believe we certified all the plans that were that were priced and, and approved. Uh, three years ago, we didn't uh, approve one because it had an impact on the lowest cost um, silver plan, which is how we how uh, the federal subsidies get determined. And um, by not approving that plan, we were able, I think, to secure an increase in the amount of federal subsidies that came to Vermonters uh, within the um, the uh, the FPLs that were getting subsidies on QHPs. So we do have an intersection, but the overall, I mean, I think you have a bigger question that is is a really good one. It's just, uh, um, you know, it's, I mean, this goes back almost to Rep Yakovon's question. I mean, the cost of healthcare in the state of Vermont, the cost of healthcare in the country, um, what are we gonna do about it? And uh, I think we're all asking the same questions. We are doing something about it um, in a, on a, on the basis of an agreement that was signed in, in the end of 2016. And um, we're testing a model right now to see if it's going to really produce the kind of delivery system evolution that we're hoping for. Thank you, Commissioner. It's a much larger question than, um, than, than we'll tackle at this point, but it, a very important question and, and certainly one uh, we look forward to um, to uh, continuing in, in when we come back for the 22 budget, but also um, initiatives that can be put in place. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Page. Did you have a follow-up? Thank you. Uh, Representative Durfee, and then we'll close with Representative Lippert. Yes, thanks. I know we're running, running over. So if this is a question that can't be answered quickly, Commissioner, I'll be happy to discuss it later with you. But it's a, it's a cost question. And, and I'm looking at the caseload uh, section of the document that you had uh, you know, addressed earlier. Uh, I, tell me if I'm doing the math right. Uh, about 15 million in additional spend and about a thousand additional uh, in the caseload, so which would come out to about fifteen thousand additional dollars per added caseload. Uh, I think you're you, you might be I'll, you might be missing a zero there. Am I, Sarah? Not if I'm. I think it's we're closer to ten thousand in increases. Is that what you, in, did you say? Ten thousand or one thousand in the caseload? Uh, I, I thought I was seeing a thousand, and I, what I'm doing is comparing. 100, the, the bottom, the bottom row, uh, the two right columns in the case slip. Yeah, that is the it, it is average, absolute, go ahead. That's the average enrollment from state fiscal year 20 to um, what we project for 21. What we were seeing before the pandemic was a regular decline in our Medicaid population and had originally projected that, um, that it would continue. So that's the, um, the actual decline pre-pandemic was greater than what we had thought it would be in 20, in 21, um, as we head into 21 and, um, the number Corey is referencing, the commissioner is referencing, I'm representative is, has to do with the difference between actual enrollment in, in, in February as to today, today. Does that make sense? Not not entirely. I'm not going to pursue it right now, though. <laughs> just uh, let's but, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it later. Yeah, I also just say that this is the consensus forecasting that happens on a. I, I don't know what the cadence is, but it's a regular um, effort between JFO, um, the administration, and AHS um, to come to the the forecast um, uh, agreement about populations, what the what the projection for enrollment is and utilization. And just in terms of the dollars, though, so that I understand, make be sure I understand that piece of it. The 15 million, 15 million, 121,000 represents the difference between what was in the recommended budget in January and what we're, what you're now recommending. Correct. For, for yeah, for program and for utilization and caseloads. Caseload people, people yeah. and what they would use. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you. you.
And there'll be follow up uh, for you, uh, Representative Durfee and uh, Representative Lippert. Yeah, very. <clears throat> Just quickly, uh, you mentioned, uh, Commissioner, you mentioned that in the by virtue of not being doing redeterminations at this point, uh, there are indeed Vermonters who continue on Medicaid, but who actually have access to other uh, insurance. Uh, do you have any estimate of what the additional costs are to Medicaid? And are is it primarily commercial insurance that is uh, reaping the yeah. benefit from no, Medicaid yeah, there's paying instead of them? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know that. And that was a little bit more anecdotal than it was, uh, you know, some sort of grouping of a population. We just, we, we don't know. We, we know we can't take people off. We do know people are asking um, in, in, in some cases, but this is, it's very anecdotal and not um, something that's uh, a, a population or a pocket of individuals that we know of. They move, I mean, it, it, it's, not something that we could necessarily pull. It's not together. something you're prepared to quantify. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Question though. Um, so uh, just very quickly, Corey, without getting into the topics, because we have heard, um, you know, the testimony and it's been debated back in January and February. Can, are there initiatives you could just remind us of that, are, that exist in the budget that we need um, to make sure we've made our final decisions on? I know that the preferred medication list for, you know, HIV. Right. That was one. The, the other is the WEX, um, the premium processing that, that gets, sorry. We've talked about the WEX. Right. Like, yeah, no, I, I don't have any that we, that are on, I'm looking at the list now for administration and I don't see um, anything that we haven't talked about. Excellent. Administration from the, from the, um, the original proposal of 2021. So I'm not, um, I don't see anything on this list uh, as far as administration goes or program that would be a, um, uh, anything we didn't discuss. Um, even our, our, our uh, governor recommended budget for 21 um, was pretty uh, streamlined as well. We had the we had that PDL and we had the transference of premium processing. Um, mm -hmm. So, so we've, and we've covered those. So um, for the committees of, uh, for the healthcare committee, the, the things that we'll be looking for um, in the DIVA budget would be the, that you look at the new language and make sure yes. that the new language uh, fits your needs. The hiring freeze, if you had any concerns about that, and then the changes in contract, I think that we've gone through all of those questions and then we have the typical changes with the internal service charges and, and then back in the 20 budget, the natural pressures with salaries and fringes and, and, we, and we will uh, look through all of those. But I, I think that this was one of the budgets that we were pretty close to uh, being complete on. And if there's any other language that you had out there that you want considered, if you could as quickly as possible, yeah. that would be wonderful. Okay. And if someone um, from if someone from Diva could articulate to uh, Jen Carby uh, or our staff the specific changes in the HIV AIDS language. Yep. I was just going to say that. Well, we will, we will ASAP. Um, the only I think I, Jen can I? On, so she that. I think Jen is on. Yes, she is. Okay. Hi, um, Jen. The, the only other is uh, Rep Lippert. The only other comment I have on the uh, on the. Uh, um, sort of Medicaid and other insurance is that we do have a uh, coordination of benefits unit that that's their job to make sure that Medicaid is the payer of last. Um, so if it's not, if, it, if there is any significant amounts in that category, um, that we would, we would assume that that unit would get at those numbers too. So just, just to sort of add to that conversation a little bit, maybe add a little bit of um, comfort that it isn't just lost um, Medicaid dollars. I'll, I'll ask some follow-up questions offline. Okay. Please. Okay. Hey, thank you. I, I think that this brings us to a close. Um, Representative Lippert, did you have any closing statement or are you no, set? Again, again, just to say, I think this was a helpful process and, and possibly something we might want to think about in the future, actually. 
rather than just seeing this as an interim uh, step between our committees. I think this is actually a productive use of our time. Yeah, I, I, I find it much more productive in it, and we're not duplicating efforts and we're hearing each other's questions. We're hearing each other's questions. I think, it's, I think it's a valuable thing and I hope we might want to recommend it as a way to proceed in the future. Thank you. And um, represent, uh, not Representative Gustafson, uh, Commissioner, thank you for coming. Uh, Lisa, thank you for coming in. And we are going to have to sign off as we have to come in new at 11 o'clock committee. We are um, 10 at, at 10 o'clock. Boy, my morning isn't going as fast as I thought. At 10 o'clock, we're coming back in to hear from Commissioner Baker from the Department of Corrections. Um, so thank you. And we'll see you all in about. Uh, uh, less than 15 minutes. Thank okay, you. I'm stopping the live stream now, Madam Chair.